Hello, everyone. Thanks for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... This is David Lapp, CEO of Pine Box Entertainment and project lead for 7C City of Five Sales. Robert Croy, lead designer of 7C City of Five Sales. Tom Brown, I'm one of the designers and playtest lead for 7C City of Five Sales. And probably from guessing from everyone's, uh, uh, <laughs> from what they've been working on, we're going to talk about 7C, City of Five Sales, the expandable. No, no, uh, this, we're actually talking about a different game today. Oh, you got it. Oh. <laughs> 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 you look so surprised. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, you, ro you rolled well on your panache. Um, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to talk about City of Five Sales, the expandable card game. Um, so so before we talk about the mechanics, which I'm very intrigued about, I think definitely the mechanics is definitely the heart of any card game. But um, I'm just curious, look, what are the origins behind this? And and if, and if I may ask afterwards, uh, well, how does this differ from previous? Because this is not the first 7C card game. Am I correct about that? Right. Yeah, what happened is, um, so those that don't know, we're... We started Pine Box as fans of the Doomtown card game. And we approached Pinnacle Entertainment Group as developers first. We continued the game, then we learned how to become publishers, kind of went from there. And, you know, in going to conventions and in making the game, we were like, you know, we, we really got to look at what else, what else are we going to do as a company? And you know, what do we love and why are we doing this kind of thing? Right. So Doomtown has a community and we're thinking, well, what would it be like to create a community like the ones that we grew up in and loved? So, you know, some of us with L5R and games like that. Um, so we had started thinking the concepts and uh, Case Lopez, um, creatively, he had come to me about this idea for an area control game. And as a developer, like, you know, this would be kind of good for 7C. And then it kind of raised the question of, well, who actually has 7C, right? Because there's talks AEG had it, then John Presents had it. Come to find out, Chaosium has it. So we approached them, said, hey, we, you know, we have this idea for a card game for 7C. Um, they liked the pitch and it kind of went from there. Um, then what happened is we kind of looked at it all as it was, as it was and said, you know, we got to really make this 7C, right? Like, what is it that we can do to this to really, you know, spice it up and make it something that we love and that the community will love? And that's where, um, you know, Tom was doing a playtest lead and kind of had agreed on that. Like, hey, yeah, this, this needs something. And that's when Croy, uh, Croy had come in, uh, along with a couple other designers, um, Chris Medico, who had worked on L5R, and Case Kiyanaga, who had worked on Transformers. Um, and Croy kind of took lead uh, with this mechanic to kind of get us to making this the swashbuckly game that it is. So to go into your second question about the CCG, this would be the second time that 7C is a card game. The first time when it was a focus on boats and ship and this time we are looking more on what is 7c about as the role-playing game and how would you take that and interpret it into a card game and really it's about heroes it's about the characters in this you know princess bride three musketeers setting so we're telling these stories about these characters so this is why we put it in the port city of five sails rather than on the open sea they say look we're going to tell this story about this open city with these five districts and vying for control of it um so getting all of that down um we've got something we really think encompasses the the whole point of 7c mm -hmm. so if, if if before we get into the mechanics I, i'm just curious um technically you could have taken this and this could have been just pirates the card game or you could use a different ip for this as well what what, what is it about 7c that that you love so much that that you want to incorporate that that into into your card game early on i was trying i was writing a design diary and i ended up titling it something like the evocation of feelings because i really like the idea of uh evoking certain feelings and people. And 7C is written in the in the way that it's larger than life characters and it is very pulpy, right? Like it's just, it is uh, literally shake the fist at the sky, high drama. 
And so the combination of a swashbuckling dueling mechanic with an area control uh, give and take between these two things, like you have to commit to one decision or the other. So every decision is tense, but every decision is meaningful. And your decisions are usually um, very restricted to an area. And I'm going to do a high stakes thing here, or I'm going to duel over there. 7C fits that really well because it's so character focused about how specific people interact with each other in a larger than life scenario. It's almost like a folk tale in a, in, in a way. And it's just, and it's really lovely. I definitely think that it encompasses that larger than life feel that just a generic pirates or generic swashbuckling world doesn't necessarily have. I mean, you can have those and they're cool, but 7C is it's crazy, like, larger than life. Like everyone is huge. It's all about being larger than life, being that fantastical person, being in a fantastical world. The, it's sorry, go ahead. It's, it's kind of like the uh, the western of the pirate world. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Seven Sea City by Sales, the card game, is adapted and influenced really heavily by the second edition of the RPG. And one of the things that is true in that game is the way that your characters handle defeat and death and stuff like that. So everything is just like, literally, as I say, shakes fist at sky, properly dramatic. That for example, one of the things that we made really sure to do in this game is that every single character is absolutely and properly unique. They are all individual, actual people, as much as cardboard can be, down even to the brutes, which are literally designed to be the expendable people, still have names. And just that entire concept with swashbuckling and, and fencing and swordplay just screams seven C. Mm. And, and David it looks sound like you had you want to add your two cents to that. No, I think they pretty much covered it. And to kind of say what we said about the westerns of the swashbuckling that kind of goes in our theme with continuing with Doomtown and also, you know, it's like this is another uh, AEG property that, you know, we love and was part of. So it's great to add that to our library. Hmm. All right, excellent. So um, would, would you be willing to kind of show me the mechanics of the card game? I'm very intrigued. Um, I plan to understand this, there's five um, factions. Am, am I correct? Correct. There yeah. are five factions. So yeah, there are five factions. Uh, they are Montaigne, Aizen, Vadachi, Usura, and Castile. Um, they all play really differently, and that's one of the things that I'm really happy to have gotten feedback on is that they're all they all feel really different. Anybody who plays any faction-based uh, card game, which most of them are, uh, will be familiar with that sort of thing. Especially if you play things like Legend of the Five Rings or even like Netrunner and stuff like that. But uh, as Dave mentioned, one of the things that uh, Case Lopez had originally mentioned was a area control game. So in my bag here, I've got Renown. So just to give you the quick rundown, there are three ways to win the game. One of the ways is to kill your opponent's leader. You can tell it's a leader because it's got a little halo around the resolve. And this character is Odette de Bois d'Arend. Uh, she's very squishy with only five resolve. So you can kill the opponent's leader. Uh, Terrell here is not a leader. The other way to win is these Renown are effectively victory points, and they're going to appear on locations. So in this game, there are three locations, the docks, the forums, and the Grand Bazaar. And you're going to control these locations, and when you control these locations, you will claim the Renown. When you get seven Renown, you win. And the last way to win is because Renown appear on these locations, it is very often the case that you'll control one Maybe you'll control two of these locations, but at the end of the day, if you control all three, even if you don't have seven renown, you'll win that way. So it's really about the factions literally fighting over the city of five sales. Hmm. Well, how long is it as in a, as a as a match? Uh, so uh, our data says anywhere uh, the average match length is about. 35 or 40 minutes. Hmm. Um, some go much longer, some go much shorter, depending on 
the factions and what each player is playing, like either more cautious or less cautious. But we really found it's about that 40, 45 minute, 35 minute mark. I was going to say, we built in a timer to the game. So you, even though the day, we call each turn a day, even though the days can be long, we're at a maximum of five days. So the game does have a timer uh, to get to an end point, uh, which is something we found, you know, in playing other Kohar games, not all of them have that. Like even our game town game, we don't have a, a set timer like that. And that's something we really like about this. Oh, cool. So that's not like a, a time limit. It could be, it could be short, it could be long. It could, because it, it could there, be, there will be five phases, uh, five rounds, which we call days. The phases mm -hmm. go from uh, dawn to dusk. So we call them days and there will be no more than five. And the, the actual game length will be about 35 to 40 minutes. We find that most games uh, usually end turn three. Uh, day three, some go to four around that time. Uh, sometimes people can wait around two around that time, but day two normally happens by like 10 minutes in, if that, like day one's pretty fast. So it's a little bit all over the, like, it's really interesting that it's a little bit all over the place, except rounds tend to be about 35 to 40 minutes, whether they play two to four days. If it goes to the fifth day, it usually goes kind of long. Ah, oh, okay. Now, this is a, a two-player match but i've heard you can expand it to four players can you talk a little bit about that so as you add more players you add some additional city locations um but it doesn't but the core mechanics are still the same hmm. um there's just more space to fight over you're still trying to win by renown assassinate your opponent hold the three Core locations. There's just extra ones that there to spread out more. Um, in this case, it's uh, the uh, old inn and then governor's palace or garden. So governor's gardens. Oh, okay. The uh, the thing that we discovered quite early is that uh, this is primarily built as a two player game, but multiplayer totally totally works uh, and is even pretty fun. But three locations for two players. There's no elbow room, so they definitely needed to have more room to spread out as more players entered. So in a three-player game, we add one additional location. And in a four-player game, we add two. Oh, okay. Now, for those that, um, that um, the, for the Kickstarter, uh, the the set that you're, that they can get, it's just for two players to, oh, or can it be expanded to four players? Or do you need to buy uh, more sets to make a four-player game? So you can you can make four decks out of the box. One of the things we put on the Kickstarter, just to make sure everyone was clear, is you're gonna get one full playset of all your faction cards, but you're gonna need some neutral cards too. So we're including two full sets of neutral cards. So you can make two decks that can use any of the cards as long as they're different factions, because you can double up on the uh on the neutral cards and two of them. But let's say you have another deck you want to do that, you know, maybe doesn't use the same neutral card. So you can make the four player uh, game out of one box. It's just that, hey, you might want to, um, you know, you might really like these certain neutral cards. So if you, if we, if we have like not today is your like evacuation card. Let's say you wanted that in all your decks. So then you'd want to buy more boxes. Um, so the short answer is you can make them all. Uh, they just might not be the ones you want them to be because of needing those extra neutrals. Okay. What, one of the things that was really, really lovely working with Pinebox is I'm sure everyone who's dealt with uh, expandable card games has dealt with the multiple play set, uh, the multiple base set shenaniganry that goes on. So uh i was just so pleased when we managed to get it so that as he mentioned there's one play set of each faction and two play set of the neutrals and the play set in the game is two so you get two copies of each non-unique thing uh, that are uh, faction based and then you get four copies of each neutral thing that is not unique hmm. yeah so that means that in one box you can make two fully competitive decks no matter what as long as they're different factions and two boxes gets you four fully competitive decks no matter what and if you're willing to stretch you can even get the fifth oh that's awesome okay so so speaking of the kickstarter uh by the way i see that you made your your goal congratulations huzzah uh, 
<laughs> so, uh, for those that haven't seen the Kickstarter yet, which I'll put a link in the description below, uh, what stretch goals do you have on here? Uh, sure. So you see, um, well, the first thing is everyone's getting a couple promos. Um, we had a, a appealing to the people to say, hey, help us out. And we'll add uh, alternate art of that promo to the box. Um, it's a card that uh, has a discount for heroes. And since you have Genny, um, one of the leaders, uh, we had a Gen Con tournament and the winners decided to make him a hero uh, before we produced the game. Uh, that kind of goes into that card. And then um, the uh, locations here that you see, uh, the first stretch goal is going to be to make a tarot-sized version of those. Um, now, we know card players, you know, you have the deck box. That's not really feasible, but it's kind of nice to maybe have it at home or if you have a different box. Uh, but we want to give that option for the tarot size. And then at um, the next level is a compass coin. That would be really cool as an initiative coin. Uh, that will go to that. every that. What's that? We need to hit that. Everybody listening needs to go fund this because that's the one that I, like, we really need that one to happen. It's so cool. Yeah, so that'll be for all backers and then an add-on. And then we've got uh, full bleed cards for those who are familiar where the art bleeds into the card. I think those are the next two. And then we've got one actually to uh, print a fan set of the uh, collectible card game. Um, that was used for uh, a Gen Con event. I think that's the final one that we have on there. Uh, so we'll yeah. see how it goes. We really want to hit the compass. Um, so if we can help it double what we have now, that would be awesome. Hmm. The compass is a first player token tracker and it uses the 7C uh, compass rose. Uh, and it ha on the flip side, it has the uh, coat of arms for each of the five factions. And it's, it's, it's so cool. Oh, what what can you share about the the art the art direction and the design direction for this card set? Uh, so I can say on the art we have a we have a mix. So we've got access to the um, seven C role playing art. Um, something that we found out is an interesting fact: the old CCG art, the rights went back to all the artists. Um, unlike Doomtown, that was the, a licensed property. Um, since it was from AEG, that was part of their deal. So we have contacted some old artists, though, to be like, hey, it'd be a cool throwback to get, you know, this piece in there. So you might see some old pieces. Um, it's it's a mix. We've got um, some brand new artists, um, like uh, Kuo Yang, who ended up doing our Crystal Eye. A couple other pieces have been great. Um, Jason Benke from L5R. Um Sergio, we have, we have a lot of them. Uh, Case would know more uh, offhand. Um, and it'll, they're, it's actually all in the plates, in the credits. It's in the rule book that's posted. Um, so we have, you know, one thing that was great about having Doomtown is we've been contacted by different artists that were like, hey, you know, would you be interested? So we had this Rolodex to kind of to kind of work from already. Um, so it is a it is a solid mix. Um, we also have some stuff from Terry Pavlet that sadly passed away um, shortly after uh, doing the work commissions. Um, and he, he had done some work, other work for Chaosium too. Um, so Case had a, definitely had a mix of styles. Um, and you can see that in the Kickstarter updates. If you look at number one, we've got some of the Badashi cards. And on the second one, we've got the neutral cards. And we'll be doing, um, or sorry, that's update two and three. And we'll be doing more spoilers and cards after this. Uh, they will be look. They look slightly different from these TTS cards, um, but they're they're very much in the same style already. Hmm. So, uh, one of the things that Lat mentioned, but we didn't actually quite say, and this goes into card design, because Case, Case was stellar, because he was uh, able to work with what either already existed or commission things that were really good for the ongoing story. So Dave mentioned that Yevgeny, we held a tournament, he became a hero. Uh, similar to other games, uh, primarily things like L5R, they do it with Doomtown as well, is that this is an ongoing player influenced story. Uh, so trying to put the actual story 
yeah, obviously the players haven't influenced it, you know, before the game started. But we able to, we were able to get some stuff. Uh, there's a few people who have uh, some vanity cards already that are in the game because of how they've helped or influenced. And then Yevgeny, one of the heroes, he's uh, one of the leaders. He's with Usura, gained the hero trait, and that's how we have been designing the cards to try to align with the story and leave it relatively open ended so that we can play to see how. It play to see what happens so we can update the story and design future cards so that that cycle repeats um when in 21 days um from now um when uh, kickstarter is over um how how complete is this game is it will this be sent straight to the printers afterwards do you still need more time to finish up some cards sure i can answer this so basically we are after the the timeline as we have it is, is after funds come in we're going to send out a PDF of the cards to the backers, and we're going to make sure that it's all on TTS so people can play, construct it all online um, while they wait for the cards to come in. This is going to give us an opportunity to say, hey, guys, uh, you know, I know some role-playing companies do this too. It's like, we're going to put this out there, take a look at it. We're going to look at it internally. You guys spot anything, um, you know, to help us out there. Then, as a celebration tournament at PAX Unplugged, we're going to have some starter decks left over from Gen Con, um, provide some updates on that, and say, hey, guys, this is like a celebration event, um, and kind of use it also as a last ditch. Uh, did we miss something? Um, you know, now now's the time to say so. <laughs> so mm, we yeah. can use that. We're going to also do an online tournament as well. Um, for the people that can't make that convention. And then our plan is to to make sure everything goes to the printer so that we're on the top of the queue when, after Chinese New Year um, and everything's good to go so that we definitely have it all delivered by Gen Con 2023 so that everything's set. Um, one advantage we have right now is that keeping in branding we're using a lot of the stuff that we did from doomtown from the weird west kickstarter we just did so like the deluxe token similar design same with the play mats so like long packs are manufactured they already know what we have in mind and, and keeping the same box size and things like that uh, so while we had a lot of delays with doomtown that's that we're in the process of getting on the boat right now in this um it's much more streamlined having everything done already and in place the rule books you know all that is is set to go with the same spe uh, specifications already so we anticipate going to print right after that and while we put august as a delivery we're really thinking like june we might be able to to hopefully get this out and that gives us some wiggle room with a, a last ditch effort of having to airlift the gen cons so we can definitely have like a really special storyline event this year or this coming yeah. year it's uh i think it you you can change things constantly lap knows that about me i he, he helps me not change everything all the time but like there is there is definitely a point where it must be done and we're rapidly approaching it and to my great surprise and pleasure it's like it's like basically done i'm, I'm tweaking a couple cards like that's that's it i'm really excited about that yeah I, to be fair i think Part of what what we're finishing at this point is trying to clean up to make sure everything is consistent. So, is there anything else about this game that you want to share that I haven't asked you about? Oh yes. All right. So two th two things, if I if I may. <clears throat> so the first one, as I mentioned, because it's a story, uh, we have a uh, a thirty card deck called the City Deck, which is you not unique to this game each card in it is unique it's exactly 30 cards and they're uniquely numbered and that's because as the story changes we'll be able to have a running list and update what should be in the city deck because the city deck at the beginning of each day one of the very first thing you do is you take the top card of the city card and you place it in each location so you're losing three right because there's three locations generally <clears throat> And these represent characters, attachments, and events that are happening in the city. So you could recruit these people, you could buy these attachments, or you could engage with these events that are happening in the city. And as the story goes on, 
let's say Angeline, who's like slot number 23, I think, we could take her out and add someone because perhaps someone really liked Angeline and was able to influence the story such that Angeline cho uh, joins one of the factions. Or, I'm sorry, Tom, what if she dies? People tend to not come back from that, so she's gone. Hmm. So that's the city deck. And the city deck is really cool because it makes the game different every time. I know people say that sort of thing, but it's like it's the same cards. But the amount of variability between not only the faction I'm playing versus the faction you're playing, but also how I built my deck versus how you built your deck, but also with how the city deck is coming up this particular game makes makes the game less deterministic but always influenceable yeah the the city deck itself is almost a third player or fifth player or fourth player mm -hmm. um and the fact that it comes up different every game and you always have to account for it even if you can't build it just like every other every time you sit down across from an opponent you have to plan for your opponent to throw a wrench in your in your plan. <laughs> and the city deck yeah, can definitely every, do that. Because each faction uses uh, the cards in the city deck differently. Uh, a card a card showing up for Yevgeny might not be as good as it's showing up for Odette, for example. Because this is how combat works, and this is why we are uh, it's, sharing screens. Yeah, it's, it's one of the uh, one of the most intricate parts of the game while being once you see it very simple so and... so here we go you ready i love this okay so this is a very common setup okay we'll say that terrell who is Isom, is at the forums and so is odette and jean on the other side so you are one player and you have uh terrell here and i am playing odette and i have odette and jean and i'm just going to go through a couple rounds I'm not going to go through every single possible rule because it gets it, it gets a little bit layered, but always consistent, and I love it. So here we go. If we look at Terrell here, you'll see that he has a combat of three. That's his first stat right there. The stat under that is that he has two finesse, and then he's got one crown, so that's influence. So three combat, two finesse, one crown. And so let's say that Terrell really wants to kill Odette because Odette's only got five resolve, and if Odette dies, you win the game. So what he's going to do is he's going to engage and grab three, what we call threat. Three, because uh, that's his combat. And he's going to throw that at Odette. Now, he hasn't actually wounded her yet. He has not, What he has done is that he has issued a challenge. Now, Odette may either accept or refuse the challenge. If she refuses the challenge, then she'll just simply take all three as wounds, and that action will be done. But that's not fun, heroic, or good. So instead, she's going to do, you, I, the player, what I'm going to do is instead do what's called intervene. So Terrell is targeting Odette, but I'm going to intervene with Jean by engaging him. Most people know that it's happening. And therefore, now Terrell is targeting Jean. This is a get down Mr. President sort of thing. Mm. However... Odette has this lovely first ability that says, when Odette is challenged, your on-guard musketeer at her location may intervene without engaging, because Odette is a proper posh lady, and she has an entourage that protects her. Jean is a musketeer. So Terrell targets Odette, sends the three threat, and Odette says, no, no, you're actually fighting Jean, and when you intervene, you accept the duel. We are now in the duel. Mm. Cool. That's issuing a challenge. Now, when you accept a duel, you must play a card. And you'll notice that in your deck, every single card in your deck on the bottom left has three symbols. The first is a little swoopy sword. The next is two swords crossed. And the last is a sword thrusting. Whenever you play a card, you will always use these symbols in order every single time. These symbols are called repost, parry, thrust. So let's go for it. I'm going to play Master of Varro's Style. It has a cost of one up in the top left, but you may always use a card for its RPT values. Repost, parry, thrust, we call it RPT. I tried desperately to come up with a better name than that for two <laughs> years in design, and it was impossible. So it's just RPT. 
<laughs> so I'm not going to spend one because I'm just going to do the RPT. We always do it in order every time. So we do a repost of one. We reflect one threat back to Terrell. Then we have a parry of one. So we parry one threat away. He sent three to me. I sent one back and I discarded one entirely. Now I thrust one. Thrust grabs a brand new threat and adds it to Terrell. And now that my RPT is done, I now resolve the threat. This one, which I did not mitigate, the one that uh, I did not do anything with, I take as a wound. And now I confirm that these two are going back to Terrell. Now that I'm all out of threat and my card is done, I place it in my dueling line, and now Terrell gets to play a card. And this just goes back and forth until all threat is resolved. This mm -hmm. rule is so important, I put it in the book twice. Combat is not over until all threat has been resolved. Mm. So let's show off a technique. Terrell is going to play press the advantage, and it has a cost of one. This has a maneuver. When you play your card in a duel, you may activate one technique and one maneuver. Maneuvers run cards that you play in that duel, and techniques run cards that are already in play, usually characters and attachments. Mm. So you get one of each. So press the advantage costs one. You pay cost in this game by discarding one card from your hand, so I would just pitch a card. And it has a maneuver that says plus one thrust and engage the adversary. If they are already engaged, plus two thrusts instead. So I'm going to throw away the card. I'm going to engage here. Uh, engage Jean, and now my one thrust on this card is a two thrust. Next, Terrell has a technique, which says plus one thrust. So I'm going to activate that as well. So now I'm going to resolve press the advantage, which is normally a one repose, one parry, one thrust. But it gained two thrust, so it's a one repose, one parry, three thrust. So here we go. We repose one, we parry one, and we go one, two, three, thrust. So Terrell manages to mitigate all of his damage, and he sends it all back at Jean. Okay, I'm going to give you one more round here, because combat is not over until all threat has been resolved. That means that it is very possible to kill a character and not end combat. So now Jean is going to play a card called Heroic End. This has a maneuver on it, and it says final strike plus two thrust uh, and gain lethal final strike is the card you play on the round that you die so we're going to play this let's activate the maneuver i repost that's a dash so i repost nothing i parry that's a dash so i parry nothing then i thrust which is three so i add my three back over there and now i resolve all of my threat I take all of this as wounds because I didn't mitigate any of it. And then I send three over there. Now, because I my character dies, he is sent to the locker. And remember, that said final strike. So since my character dies, I add two more threats to him. Mm. I, add this to, I add this to my dueling line. But now, since combat is only over when all threat is resolved, Terrell still gets a chance to mitigate this damage. So he will play Breastplate. Breastplate has no repost, three parry, one thrust. He will not activate a maneuver. He will not activate a technique. So he reposts nothing. He parries three. He does technically thrust one back to the adversary. And since there was two that he did not mitigate, he takes the two. And he sends the one back over to Jean. Jean isn't here to play a card. It fizzles. And then, therefore, his action is done. Hmm. So now this is this is one of the lovely things about this game. Terrell started that fight. And now that that fight is over, now it's the Odette's player's turn. So she can go do something else somewhere else. We just get right back into the game. So whenever there's a duel in 7C, we kind of zoom in on that duel and we resolve that duel with a back and forth swashbuckly princess bride-like fencing scene. And then as soon as the duel is done, we zoom out and we go right back into the rest of the city. The combat in this game feels really like you're playing the game, like you're playing the role-playing game. The the, the sword fighting is that's really amazing. I had some feedback at um we went to Chaosium Con and had brought this and showed the seven C players because we were like 
like, hey, we really want your feedback. And that's what they were like, yeah, this feels like being in the game. I was demoing this to people, and they're like, I literally saw that combat in my mind with, mm. the, back, with the back and forth. Yeah, it's I very also, visual. Thank you. It I'm is. glad you say that, because I... When I first designed this, I came to the I came into our design chat and I'm like, guys, guys, I figured out combat. I know how we're gonna do it, okay? And then I tried to explain it via text. It was like, Croy, you're insane. This makes no sense. I have no idea what you're saying. Like, dude, just sit at a table and push quarters back and forth, okay? Like that's our combat. <laughs> yeah. It, when he first came to us with the idea, we're like, it was like several paragraphs. We're like, we. Roy, what are you talking about? Like this? <laughs> what is this? Um, Why are you on design, Croy? Get out of here! <laughs> and then, um, he showed us this, and I don't. We were, we were like, we had the cards didn't have any art or anything, and he just showed us this, and we're like, oh, no, that's really that's really simple. That that makes sense. Yeah, when I demo the game and I have them, when I demo the game, I have them move the chits back and forth because I'm like, no, you physically need to perform this action. You do it. So you feel like you're moving the thread around because that's what you're doing. And then they always get it so much faster. Mm. Yeah. Though our learn to play rulebook that we have out now, um, or we will be having out, goes through it very nicely. Um, I do think that there's something about this combat that's really nice to sit down and to do it. It's so like right though. It is. It, uh... it, and as I mentioned, there's a few other things that I didn't get into, but like it feels like a push your luck game because you're like, oh, he only sent me one threat. I could take it and just end the duel. Or or I could send four threat back and hope he can't play a guard. Hmm. And then they play a card and then you die instead. It's like, ah, I should have just took the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. And if folks do want to see more of it on the Kickstarter page, there's a full TTS demo and also the two finalists from Gen Con recorded a game. Uh, so those are both on there. And the Learn to Play book is there. We are going to be adding four more pages uh, of, of material and the rule book is also on there. It's at 44 posts and it'll be 48 at the end. We left some space to say, Hey, is there anything we missed or um, well, some more story or things like that. Um, but that'll all be ready um, and to go out and as PD as PDFs um, after the Kickstarter. Mm. Oh, yeah, just... oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, designing the game, we we knew that we needed to learn to play because of the combat and all of that. So, all right, I am actually I saw it today. Lap the the updated version, and it, it looks really good. Hmm. Uh, and then if you ever get confused by something, you can go to the more comprehensive rulebook. But you should not need to go to that for your first for your first game. You just go to that with questions if you even have any. Uh, that definitely became the game, the place where we wrote like, well, what happens if the edge case of this edge case of this edge case? And that's not, that's where I live. That's not where most people live. It's okay. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we definitely, hmm. okay. we definitely push to have that learn to play game. Hmm. Um, uh, excellent. Um, so I, I guess what's going to be stopping by your table at PAX Unplugged this year? Oh, I'm going to be dressed up, man. Oh, awesome. You're going to see our community manager, Carl. We're both, both going to be pirates. Do it. Apparently, there's a boat, too. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we just got a boat. <laughs> we got a boat. Yeah, we actually have a really nice spot at Pax Unplugged. So if anybody shows up, it should be as soon as you walk in. Um, it's tournament area, open play, exhibitor hall. We're actually, our whole thing is going to be in the tournament area. Um, so you will see the boat uh, is the first thing. Hmm. All right, excellent. Well, Thank you three for showing me this. This is amazing. Uh, two of you out there. Again, I'll put all the links in the description below. Um, I wish you gentlemen well. And um, everyone, we'll see you next time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.